Okay, so two days down and only about uh, a thousand more to go, but here we are on day three. So on day three, if I'm not mistaken, let me double check. You have mostly worksheets to do. So after you finish page 111, you'll go to day three, six traits, 114, 115, and 117. And then you've got a new type of worksheet from elements of language. And elements of language is like those uh, purple books that we use in class, the ones that we did the tests in. And then at the end of day three, after you do your worksheets, you've got five questions to answer right here. They're really quick. It's just a review of look at me. I can pick out subject and verb really quickly and it gives you an explanation and it's just a few examples of, of that going on. So I'm going to scroll down to your worksheets, the first one that says day three. So here we are at day three. I don't think your page number is on this one. That's completely my fault. It could have very possibly gotten cut off, but who knows at this point. So six traits, standard usage is what we're trying to, to get to. So this is like the, not all of these are minor mistakes. Some of them are really important and really common and, and really obvious. There and there is one that we point out all the time. But then we've got things like fewer or less. We've got beside besides and, and some other things down here that we don't really notice. And to be honest, if you're speaking to someone in casual dialogue, you're just talking to, to your friends, your family, things like fewer versus less aren't going to matter. They're not even really going to be that noticeable. But if you're in a situation of writing a formal paper or even writing an informal paper even if you're just in any type of academic setting other students um, other scholars academics are going to notice this difference and once you move up in your education little mistakes like this start to establish or diminish your credibility as a writer as as an author as as someone expressing an opinion. So it kind of it kind of defines your level of education. Not to say that very intelligent people don't know the difference between these two. If you don't practice it, don't study it, you're not going to remember the difference. Not to say that this is a difference between intelligent and unintelligent. It's just a matter of academic detail and collegiate standard is what it is. Day three doesn't really have a standards box. This is just kind of straight up conventions of English. So that which is a standard in in your West Virginia learning tree. It is a standard. However, it's pretty obvious why you, <laughs> why you would be practicing this in English class, why this is relevant to English class. Regardless of the level of necessity of these uh, of these choices here, it's still important that you are exposed to the differences, to know that there are differences and what they are. So even if you're not going to remember them 10 years from now because you're not using them all the time or practicing them all the time, um, at least you've been exposed to them and you're educated enough to know that there is a difference and one is correct and one is incorrect. And then it likely just becomes a matter of using resources at that point. Using resources to look up definitions and apply your understanding of those definitions and of those rules. That's academia at the end of the day and that's uh, being truly educated at the end of the day. In my sloppy handwriting, I have attempted to write the differences between words that you may not even know that there is a difference between with because without a resource, you wouldn't know that. Most people, most college students, most adults would have to look these up to know or to be reminded of the difference. So if nobody's ever told you, there is a difference between beside and besides. Beside would be close or next to, and besides is in addition to, and I'm looking up at the top right there. Then we've got the difference between less and fewer. Less is an amount of things that are measured, and fewer is pertaining to items or things that are counted. So there's a difference between measuring and a difference between counting. So there's a difference between measuring and counting that we're accounting for here. Both words can refer to abstract and concrete nouns. And then here's your example. 
You could say there are a number of hours, but not a number of time. So time is something that can be measured, but not necessarily counted, as is the attempt at that example there. And then we've got all together versus all together. Um, this right here, the two different words, all together, and that's pertaining to everyone. That's pertaining to people or things, individual things such as every one, every individual, um, versus all together as one word, which means completely, as in we are covering this document all together. We are covering this document um, in its entirety. Like equals followed by uh, a pronoun or noun. So like versus as though is a situation of where it's happening in the sentence. So like would be followed by a pronoun or a noun as though uh, followed by subject and a verb. And looking at it now, I can see that may not make very much sense to a student. It would even be unclear to me or anybody even if I didn't write it myself. But like is essentially the verb in the main clause and as though is a conjunction that would begin a subordinate clause. So as though is going to be followed by a subject and a verb just like any subordinating conjunction. While Sally read her book would be a subordinate clause because it has a subordinating conjunction of while which is the main subordinating conjunction we talked about in that basic grammar PowerPoint which you have in live grades available to you that was sent to you um, in a mass message through live grades to everyone. And then like would be followed by an object. Like would be part of the verb or could be referred to as the verb in, in certain situations. So you could say mauve is like purple, not mauve is as though purple if that makes sense. So it's it's honestly it's honestly something that you kind of just need to be exposed to and kind of need to take a little bit of time to wrap your head around. So if you need more examples on that, you can uh, you can look them up, you can watch videos about them. Don't really know how much more how much better I personally can explain it and that's a fault of mine, not a fault of of the student not understanding it. It's just a, a matter of wording. <laughs> so maybe my wording would not click for you in that situation. If ever we are in a situation where my wording does not click for you, it does not make sense, that's kind of a, a flag, a red flag for you to kind of maybe look for resources on your own. And that's going to happen throughout your education with, with every teacher you have and every topic you cover, especially as you, as you get older and and subjects become more complicated and more in depth. Sometimes you really just have to seek out options that are explained differently, maybe that are explained more visually than this, because I'm a little bit limited right now to this. But anyway, you've got uh, number 21 written really sloppy right here. Definitely got cut off and I had to rewrite it. I had to kind of write over the part that was cut off a little bit there and it got a little more messy than I intended, but it says there that 21 is non-standard, but it should be burst. So that's kind of telling you that both are acceptable, but there's one that's more acceptable than the other. So if this were a test question, you would be in the situation of having to select the quote-unquote best response, and your best response would be burst in that situation on 21. I've also checked 19 over here. We came home early because it started to rain. Without looking it up, without having a resource, you wouldn't know that the phrase being as is somewhat non-standard. You can kind of read this and tell we came home early because it started to rain. You can pretty well tell that and it's it's kind of difficult to imagine a normal situation where somebody somebody would say being as it started to rain. Let's say a student was unsure of that um, and they've been exposed to different types of writing from different places. Maybe they might get a little stumped on that. I already put a check mark there so it's already your point to have regardless of what you've picked there because it's just a little bit of a, 
almost a cultural context type of thing. It's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more of a, of a cultural thing and kind of a, a style of writing thing or, or a manner of speaking in certain situations. But anyway, it's just like 21. It's, it's a little bit non-standard. It's your point to have. You've already got it. Day three, more conventions of writing, as I said before. This is a, is a situation where you don't have to rewrite all of this and you don't have to rewrite all of this. You actually don't have to really write much of anything for the second one down here. But for this one, it's gonna be more of a situation of you writing, and here's what I, I tried to write it here, but it looks really bad. You may simply write number one is, blah, 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 number two, number three, just like a normal response to any numbered question you would have. Most of the sentences in the paragraph below contain one or more errors in agreement. So remember in that basic grammar PowerPoint where we talked about the importance of subject verb agreement. And the basic grammar PowerPoint we discussed in class and the one that's available to you through live grades, we talked about the importance of subject verb agreement in number. So whenever you hear somebody say subject verb agreement, they're talking about whether or not the numbers match up. The only numbers you would be referring to or concerned with would be one or more than one. The difference between plural and singular is what you're concerned with. Remember we talked about most students wrote sentences like my goals is, one of my goals are, a few of my goals is. And those sound really odd and they're incorrect because the numbers don't agree. Because you're you're trying to set together a plural subject with a singular verb or vice versa, a singular subject with a plural verb. And it creates problems and it creates non-academic writing. So that's what you're trying to fix here. It says draw a line through each incorrect verb or pronoun and write the correct form in the space of, above it. You don't necessarily need to do exactly that. As long as you can mark on this page that you understand what's agreeing and what's not, then you're good to go. Then you've met the standard. You've demonstrated to me that you understand subject verb agreement. You can go ahead and write them out if you want to. You can write them out number one down here if you want to. It would look something like um, the joy of early rising don't. So that's a that's a problem right there. That's a, a number disagreement right there. The joy of early rising doesn't mean much to Andy is what it should say. So for number one, you're going to write don't becomes doesn't or you could just write doesn't. Especially when school days are concerned. Um, so that would be two different errors for number one that she would need to fix. So you can write that out if you want to. But you can also try to kind of indicate it um, around here. But eventually once you get into the middle, you're going to start to kind of run out of space. So that's kind of up to you as the student to determine how you want to do that, how you're comfortable doing that, and how that makes sense to you. Next, this one's a little bit a little bit tricky. Um, directions in the following paragraph, the verb tenses are not consistent. Decide whether the paragraph should be in the present or the past tense. It's not asking you to do anything else. It's not even asking you to mark anything up. It's just trying to get you to think about, is this more appropriately told as a story that happened in the past or is it more appropriately told as a story that's happening right now and you don't have to do anything else you just have to decide should it be in the present or should it be in the past and then you're done with that one moving on to another day three this is just a proofreading type of worksheet so this is kind of an overarching proofread Proofread the passage below by adding commas, semicolons, colons, and end marks where they are needed. All of those things are discussed in the basic grammar PowerPoint. So we talked about in the PowerPoint the four places. Originally it was the three places. Uh, I only had three places listed in the PowerPoint, but I do believe before I sent it out that I changed it to four. I'm going to limit you to four places where commas should go. And by four places, I mean only in lists, only to separate independent clauses, 
from other independent clauses, only to separate an interjection from the rest, and only to cut off a subordinating clause from the rest of its sentence. Those are the only four types of commas you need to use. Otherwise, forget the rest that, that we've been trying to use as we've gone through middle school. As I'm looking at these worksheets and I'm seeing some examples of interjections set up in an odd way that would be unclear to a student that's not used to certain types of writing, um, I'm seeing that confusion. I'm seeing, I'm seeing how that confusion has been created. But we just kind of, we just got to work through it and clear up that confusion as we go. We're here to get better. We're not here to start at a perfect place. We're here to get better from wherever we are. So this is asking you to do punctuation. I also told you that there is also at least one word to cross out. When selecting this page, I, I read it through. And then I also found out that there was some word that just did not work. It was just a typo. There's plenty of typos in this worksheet. It does not mean that. It does not mean that it's not valuable. It's really valuable. It's just that out of hundreds and hundreds of pages of work like this, there's bound to be minor typos, at least. But at least you have the opportunity to proofread it and catch it. Next is somewhat of the same thing. Insert commas where they are needed in the following paragraph. Remember that there are only four types of comma usage that I want you to go for and forget the rest. Read the dialogue below. Cross out. See, there's a typo right there. Cross out any incorrect punctuation or capitalization and add the correct punctuation marks and capitalization. So that's in your basic grammar PowerPoint. We understand capitalization. That was the first thing you guys called out about sentence structure. And, and we've learned that since we were in probably kindergarten. We've, we've got a good foundation to stand on with that nonetheless. So that's page 117. And then this is also day three. This is when your worksheets start to change. So now it's no longer six traits. Now it's your elements of language workbook that, that coincides with the purple language book that we use in class. It's the same publisher, the same intention. They're a set together or a part of a set, a large set together. And this is the grammar section of that workbook. So sentence and sentence fragments. So that's been the focus this whole time so far at the beginning of our year. This workbook is really cool because, and the textbook that goes with it is really cool because it explains everything so well up front over and over. You've got an explanation, another explanation of a sentence, uh, examples of fragments, and then a clear example of a good sound sentence. For your exercise, all you have to do is identify what can stand on its own and what can't. So we know the four criteria for a complete sentence. It's in our PowerPoint, it's in our notes. We're gonna be quizzed on it in the future. We absolutely are. Here's the type of comma that I noticed, um, the, the type of comma usage that looked at first to be very similar as to the extra commas that we wanna use all the time. But what's really happening here is that this is not just a comma before any conjunction. This is a comma cutting off an interjection. This interjection is a definition of carnivores. It's not carnivores or meat eaters. It's carnivores defined as meat eaters. So I saw this and I was like, oh, okay, this could be why they're confused. <laughs> because they've seen things like this, but... Remember that from that PowerPoint, you're never going to cut off the objects from their verb. There's no reason to cut off carnivores from R. So why would there be a reason to cut off another object from R? But right here, it's used correctly, exactly how I would want you to use it, because this is an interjection. You could place this in the middle of the sentence. You could say carnivores, comma, or meat eaters comma, include bears. And then it would be a clearer interjection, but right here it's a little bit unclear, but it's nonetheless correct. So this is pretty straightforward. Use your notes, use your PowerPoint, use this explanation right here to get through it. You can get through it. It is not that bad. You don't have to mark anything, by the way. You just have to fill out this part right here. This is the part that's graded. Uh, moving on, and then we get into day four. 
I'll talk about day four, of course, in another video. For the rest of your day three, I've kind of already explained it. The worksheets are part one and part two, and then we've got part three, and that's actual work on the actual packet itself. So on the actual packet, you would mark up these sentences in this way and it's already been discussed many times it's just a quick reminder just a quick silly exercise and then we'll talk about day four in the next video